I am extremely happy to welcome a longtime friend of the Hollywood Historical Society. He will talk to us today about banished Broward, lost sites in Broward County. Please help me welcome Broward County Historic Preservation Officer, Rick Ferrer. Beautiful introduction. Uh, <clears throat> Happy Historic Preservation Month. This is May, and this is a month that we celebrate history, culture, preservation, heritage uh, throughout the United States, by the way. And i um, happy to be here. I'm happy to be addressing the Hollywood Historical Society. I know Karen very well from years back, and Clive as well. I've gotten to know him uh, recently. I am not a native. My family is originally from Chile and South America, and um, we came here in the late 1960s. And we've been in Florida since 1972. Just about almost all these sites that we're going to cover today, um, I wasn't familiar with them. I learned about them. I'm a student of history more than I'm a historic preservationist. So you all probably have a lot more to teach me than I have tonight, this afternoon with you. But um, the information that I have here is from secondhand sources, the internet, of course, conversations with some, some folks that visited it. And um, I'm just, as a detective of history, I find all of this quite fascinating. We're not gonna look at institutional buildings this afternoon or sites that everybody is well acquainted with, with you know, maybe uh, schools or houses and and structures that we know have disappeared. We're gonna look at fun stuff. And we're gonna look at kitty attractions, we're gonna look at roadside zoos and uh, this kind of thing. I know that this is a topic that's been done before and many people have done it really, really well. But it's always a good idea to bring it back because these are the ones that they open and close and then they disappear forever and they're not coming back. There's no way. Um, the one that is coming back, and it has come back lately, which uh, was mentioned earlier, the Great Southern Hotel, that was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, they tore that thing down completely. There's nothing left of the original building. Did you ever think that they were going to rebuild it, or, you know, a, a similitude or anything like that? No, I, I never thought that. And the architect, kudos to the architect, they did a wonderful job. It looks great. It's not the original. No. It's a replica. We must understand that that's not the real thing. That's not where the movie happened back in 69. Fantastic movie. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. There you go. And uh, all the memories that that building must have had, had for people for generations, you know, from way back when and right up until the recent past when perhaps it was a hobo hotel. I don't know exactly what it was at the end, but you know, a lot of people would have had memories tied to that building. And unfortunately, what's there now is like a beautiful replica, but it is a replica. Mausoleum. Correct, a mausoleum, if you will. Um, it's not the real thing. So I lament that the, the real thing is gone. I'm happy that something is there, you know, that kind of recalls it. It fits nicely with downtown. It looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. It does. It really does look beautiful. Um, but in the work that I do, we try to preserve. And again, I'm, I work for Historic Preservation for Broward County. So we try to avoid complete destruction and demolition where we can and work with developers and try to get preserved something, not everything, because you know, it's, it's a difficult field. It's difficult to work with people that would rather not um, see the history here, you know? And maybe you all, as people that have lived here for decades or a long time, or maybe even born here, you know the stories, you know, have the connection, but a heck of a lot of people don't, including people that I work with. My, my, my you know, my director is from England, my, every, everyone in my office is from other, other cultures and other countries. So it's hard to get, communicate that thing about history and buildings and structures and things that mean something to people. Hard to communicate that to other folks. 
again, I myself am not from here, but I, I do love the place. So let's get started with the presentation. I hope you have fun. Um, I'm not sure we, we can dim the lights a little bit. And so, yep, these are very lost sites that we're going to cover today. They are gone. They're not just a little bit lost, they're totally gone. And they will not be making a comeback. Um, Again, my name is Rick Ferrer. I'm the Preservation Officer for the Urban and Planning Division for the Historic Preservation Program that is run by Broward County. Hollywood is not in our jurisdiction, by the way. Cover. Oh. Uh -oh. Thanks. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that means anything. <laughs> All right. So, um, this is. Holly, the City of Hollywood has its own Historic Preservation Board ordinance, and the Planning Department for Hollywood, they do their own thing. They don't, they, they, I work for Broward County. So Broward, our, our Broward program includes 24 cities. Of Broward's 31, we, we have 24 cities. That's a big portion. And um, also small pockets of unincorporated county areas. So. It's nearly impossible to cover all, most, oops, or even a fraction of Broward's lost sites. This presentation is dedicated to locations that were centered for pure enjoyment and wonder. Some were gimmicky, fantastical, showy, and entertaining. Some were a window to a tamed natural world with obedient animals and exotic landscapes. These sites had short lifespans and their memory is now largely obscured or forgotten. Perhaps they were too frivolous to be taken seriously, but oh, did they provide a sense of wonder, a little enchantment, and a bit of charm. May these long lost sites never completely disappear from memory. So note, please, this is an interactive lecture. We're gonna have fun, hopefully. Uh, feel free to chirp in when the slide asks, what site was this, if you know the location? So I didn't pick very obvious slides, obviously. None with lettering that says on top of them, this is this kind. And a lot of slides have that. You know, a lot of the postcard images showed you exactly what you were looking at. So it's not going to be easy. I can guarantee it. Let's begin. Oops. What site was this? Don't look at the lettering. It was on US 1 across from the airport. Oh my gosh, really good. Yes. Anybody else want to give it a try in terms of a name? Oh my gosh, you're right. The monkeys are back. You got it right. <laughs> you got it completely right. Yes. This was the chimp farm. And it was across the, today's airport. It was on US 1. And here's a couple of relics from the Chimp Farm days, uh, promotional brochure, brochures and a postcard image. It actually did not start as a chimp farm. It started as a primate breeding center. And in the 40s, I believe it was 1940, yes, 1944. For testing? I'm sorry? For what was the purpose of breeding chimp? Breeding, it, for they brought um, monkeys and apes here from directly from Africa. I guess they put them through Port Everglades and immediately they landed in this facility and they were bred there, they were maintained there and bred and yes, they were sold to research facilities in the United States. This was again in the 1940s, right before the end of World War II. So, and it had a name, uh, let's see if I can find the name. Well, anyways, can't find the name, but it was a, again, it started off as a breeding center for monkeys. And we all know that today, this is a very controversial issue. And, um, but apparently through the research that was done with, from uh, monkeys from this site, they were able to develop a polio vaccine, or so the story goes. So maybe some good came out of it. Um, 
in the late 1940s, it was purchased and it ceased to be more a uh, breeding ground, a breeding center for export of monkeys, and it became more of a tourist attraction. And that's when it was renamed as the Dania Chimp Farm. And um, they built this kind of replica giant scale um, simian in the front yeah. to bring in the people, and they put a concession stand in the back where you could buy, you know, trinkets and food and what whatnot, and they brought in the Seminoles from right here, from Dania. Um, at that time, it was called Seminole Dania Plant um, Reservation, Hollywood today. Um, so the, the Seminoles, they actually lived here, but they were being driven every day to this site where they're a Seminole village, quote unquote, was constructed and they would sell their, their um, arts and crafts and trinkets to tourists. And the boats would come in through the Dania Cutoff Canal and stop there. They also built a alligator wrestling pit, which a lot of these sites seem to have. This isn't the only one. But uh, yes, alligator wrestling was a big thing. And there was a, um, excuse the expression, a white young guy there to you know open the mouth of the alligator. And the story was, the gimmick here was that he had grown up with his Seminoles he had stopped speaking English. This is part, of course, of the you know the story of getting people here. And um, he was really Seminole by culture, although he was a white man, and he had learned from the the Seminoles how to wrestle with with you know these ferocious uh, alligators. Well, of course, the story wasn't true, but it was sure exciting. And how does you know? Mom pa, mom, mom, pa, and the kids from, I don't know, Minnesota or Dubuque, you know, wherever the case, the case may be, how do they know it's not true? So it was, it was quite a spectacle, and of course he got tipped very well for that, as well as the other folks. Um, so we continue, there's the Gator Wrestling, more brochure views and, and monkeys. Uh, where was it? I really did not know where it was. The brochures did not indicate an address or anything like that. But this aerial seems to indicate, it was late, this aerial is in the 1950s, yep, mid 50s. But you can actually see, so this, the canal is the Dania Canal, obviously. The, right, and then uh, for me, for instance, not having somebody to show me this where it was, this was kind of like a little bit of a detective thing. What looks the closest to what could be, you know, use the process of illumination. So there was the canal, there was the US-1, which is the diagonal, and uh, the bridge. Let me see if I can get this thing on. It's at Griffin Road, right across. Exactly, right across. Right, so Griffin, Griffin Road. This, this is Griff, the old Griffin today, Yeah, old right? Oh, wow. This is the new Griffin today, right? This is US-1, and the rail, you know, the rail, the FEC rail line is right, I believe it's this one right here. And, and then Patty, it turned into a patio furniture sales place after that, too. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I'm not so sure about that one, but maybe you're right. I but being there. From what I understand, in the 50s, in the 50s, this plot of land was purchased by Florida Power and Light. Yes, that's what they're now. Okay, and lo and behold, that's what it looks like today. There's the same exact property. Here it is. You'd never know it was a chimp farm. And this is what it looks like. So they really did a number on this popular tourist spot. Um, kind of sad to see this kind of thing. But, you know, the price of progress. Now, if you want. They also used it for a haunted house on occasion, on Halloween. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, really, really. With actors and wow. chainsaws. Oh my gosh. The whole bit, yeah. Wow. Um, I walked through the embankment of the Dania Canal. Go back one. Sure. No, I thought you had the monkey there. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to the monkey. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so within the trash and the debris that's located adjacent to the north bank of the canal, um, I found some debris, dated debris, I don't really know if it's from the Dania chimp farm, but you find broken tiles, for instance, and um, I found an old pipe and stuff, and I, my guess is this possibly could be debris from the, from the original demolition in the 50s of the chimp farm. 
There was more than one structure, obviously. It wasn't just chicky huts. So, and the monkey business actually continues to this day. Many of this, you already know, that escaped velvet green monkeys or green velvet monkeys from Sierra Leone in Africa originally, escaped in the 40s and breeded in the what they called swamplands um, of n near the airport, but it's Verbal, mangrove. They're vermin monkeys. Well, yeah. Verbal. Uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. These monkeys are now a cherished population for Dania, and the people in Dania love them. And they're actually being studied not only by Florida Atlantic University, but actually the world over. Whoops. And, uh, oh, this thing is like moving by itself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the story actually continues. So it's funny. This place is long gone. It's been paved over. It's disappeared. But for you know the, the monkey presence is actually still in here with a, a troop of. It's been estimated 40 plus monkeys. Uh, unfortunately, back in 2016, 17, some hunter gang came in here. He didn't kill them, but he captured a good percentage of them for sale. And he said he had a license from fish and wildlife to do that, they are considered exotic, so they're not native, they're technically not protected animals. And he was able to capture them and get, you know, an incredible amount of money for each one by selling, reselling them. It was thought that he had gotten most, that the, the, the few that remained would not be able to reproduce, but there's still a troop out there, and there's approximately, from the la latest estimates, more than 40, yes? They're, they're also behind that, uh Motel 6 yes. on, uh, behind the yep. Indian near High Line. Yes, these are the same ones. These are, these, they, they have a broad area, a range. The range is huge. They don't stay in one little corner. So yes, you're absolutely right. They're, they've been known to be around the motel. They cross over to the other side. They're, they're, they're literally everywhere. Um, another interesting aside is that today, Seminole Tribe Chairman and this is on their website, was born in the Dania chimp farm back in the 40s. Who knew that? And this is on their website. So their mother, his mother must have been an employee of the chimp farm working in the village as a seminal, you know, as a, in, the, in these recreated villages for the tourists. I found that that kind of cool. This was a totally accidental find, by the way. I wasn't, I wasn't looking up uh, at all the seminals. I was looking up uh, something else. So, moving on to the next site. What site is this? Yes, we got it right away. Oh my God, it, this is like, I'm not gonna do very well here with you guys. <laughs> I'm trying to trick you. This is Ocean World on 17th Street, or was on 17th Street. And Ocean World was a small marine attraction that included Obviously, a troop of dolphins, seals, basically marine life, and not much else. These folks, I believe they got started in 1965, if I'm not mistaken, and it lasted until 1994. By the end of its run, it wasn't doing well, supposedly, and there was a, the, the, an art institute was interested in the property, they, the tourist attraction, um, Ocean World, was, was actually owned by the same entity that owned the Art uh, Institute. So I don't know exactly what the story is there, but it may have been losing money or maybe it wasn't losing money and maybe they just, you know, they wanted to put the Art Institute in there temporarily. Of course, that's not what there's, what's there now. But um, it lasted... You know, again, it was quite controversial at the end because one of the dolphins had been dropped when it was moved from one uh, tank to another. And the dropping of the dolphin caused its, its um, I believe, its tail end to, to break. And then the dolphin didn't do well after that, and he died of pneumonia. So that got them in trouble, and they, there, was, you know, there was a hefty fine um, that incurred. And then another guy got bitten, a tourist got bitten by a dolphin. He got too close to the tank, and I guess the dolphin wasn't that agreeable to him, and it happened more than once. Apparently, the, the lawsuit said, claimed 
that many people have been bitten by dolphins there. I don't know if that's true, but in the end game, all these kind of like small issues, and then again, the fact that they perhaps were not doing as well at the end of their, you know, kind of, it was written on, on the wall there that, yes? It was very small. Was very small. small as, the weight at the end. Yes, really. correct. Super small. And there it is, there's the protesters. This was in the 1990s when, you know, a lot of people were, object, just as they are right now, there are people object to see aquarium down in, in Miami. The same thing, you know, free Lolita and free yeah. Yeah, this kind of thing. So where was it? Um, here it is, today. Would you ever know that it existed? This gigantic complex is on the site of what used to be Ocean World. Wow. Next site. What site was this? Storyland. Yes. Oh my gosh, you guys are too good. Storyland, yay. Storyland was up in Pompano and it was built right up against US-1 on land, actually that had, it, it was land, and I'll show you an aerial of what it looked like before it was actually developed. They had to dig out all those lagoons and canals and whatnot, it did not look like that initially. So, their Storyland had a combination of, you know, it was really for children and it had a mother goose and it had, it had a clown at the entrance that, you know, kind of like welcomed you and then it had, um, the lamb, late, uh, Mary had a little lamb. I mean, I, those of you that were there will remember much better than I can retell what, what it had and what it didn't have, but it was basically all related to um, storybook tales. And there was the, this was pre-Disney World, of course, but they did a good job and the replicas were really well, well done. Um, oops, there we, are we going back? They, again, the canals that, were actually dug, they were excavated, they didn't exist there before. And so to get to it, it became an island, they created an island um, for Storyland. Here it is on the left-hand side, um, a 1955 aerial, which shows, let's see if this pointer is working. Um, this is what became Storyland, and as you see, it's there are really no canals or anything. And then this is what it became, a complete island, a uh, fantasy island uh, unto itself. And it was connected through a bridge, the cars parked along US-1, and then kiddies would have fun in the afternoon. The problem with Storyland is, was, um, and it's been pointed out that unlike Disney, which appeals to children and adults, Storyland only appear, appealed to children. So the parents were basically at their children's mercy for a couple hours and they were bored. <laughs> so in that sense, it didn't, you know, it kind of like waned. And, the, and talk about the generation that enjoyed uh, Storyland. This was the post-war generation, the boomer generation as, as people from that era are called. So when they grew up, you know, basically Storyland was not, you know, it kind of waned as well. And unfortunately, the worst possible scenario happened to Storyland. It was uh, purchased and by a car dealer. And in 1971, you can see that the car dealership has filled in the canals, bulkheaded the kind of north, northwest corner of Storyland, and then first they put in a used car lot there for a, for a car dealership. And next step was to build a condominium, which is still there today. Whoops, right there. There's two built, really large buildings, by the way. And Storyland is under this gigantic asphalt parking lot today, um, you know, that serves the condominiums. Here it is. Yeah, another place that bit the bullet and doesn't look anything like it did before. It's it's the case with almost every one of these sites that we're going to cover, but in some cases you'll be surprised to see there are small little vestiges of sites that are left in different ways. What was this? Bridge Park. Yes, but more specifically. It was a railroad. Yes, a children's railroad, right? So, no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're a lot older than I am. <laughs> so, yes, 
Um, this was a narrow gauge uh, railroad, and I, I think it was built to scale. I'm, I'm not sure what the story is, but it was a steam locomotive, and it was built, ex it was just reduced in size, but it looked exactly like an original of its era, and it even had the year, the year, the original year that these things were running around, with, I'm not sure if it was 1865 or what, whatever year it was, but it was, well, it was, according to what I read, it said that they had a year painted on the side of the, of the, of the train, of the, of the exact year that it was supposedly, you know, running around. So this thing lasted right up until the 1980s. And yes, I do remember it because my dad had, even though we lived in Miami, my dad loved Birch Park. And this was his favorite beach and park ever. And we would come all the way from Kendall in Miami because my dad did not like the beaches in Miami. He was a classical music person, and he did not appreciate the kind of music that you heard in Miami, Miami beaches. So this is where we came. And yes, I do remember this, this train. Yeah. There was a huge lawsuit because of that, because Antioch uh, College owned it, and there was a reversionary clause that would go to them because it was an amusement park and not uh, a nature area as it was designated to be, and they almost lost it. Huge Thank you. Well, you explain why it's gone because it's been uh, a matter of debate as why it isn't still there. There was people don't really know why it was removed and never came back. In some cases, they've rebuilt trains like that in, in parks, not this one. This one is completely gone, and um, this is, I think, the last vestige left, which is like um, the, the the part that went over one of the waterways. Um, let me see. I think it had a 20 year run, but let me double check for you. Hold on. And the park itself, many of you may know, Mr. Birch came to Florida in the late 1800s and he began buying property, especially beachfront property, and the property that would become his, his beachfront area, he consolidated all that after buying, you know, plot, plot by plot and consolidated all all of it by 1903 and when he passed, let's see, when he died in 1941, he actually gave it to the state of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Yeah, right. So we have now the benefit of this gentleman's magnanimous, um, his house is still there, by the way. It's part of the park. It's not really open to the public, but it's, it's right along, um, you actually can see it when you pass along A1A. It's hidden in there like within the great, um, I believe, yes, there was a connection there. Uh, then, the, then his daughter, uh, Mary, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure, I'm not an expert. I wish Denise was, Denise was the curator of the Bonnet House, she would know. He, he gave that to his daughter and son-in-law, and then actually she passed away, and the son-in-law remarried, and, you know, allowed them to keep the property and everything at Bonnet House. So, so yeah, all. there's a connection between the two, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and then we fortunately have the Bonnet, <clears throat> the Bonnet House property as well. Mm -hmm. So it's side by side to, yeah. to the, the Bonnet House property is not a state property though, it's, it's, it was owned by the Land Trust of Florida, but now I believe it's a localized nonprofit group that runs it. There are monkeys there too. There's monkeys at, They're I, all men. I spoke to Denise the other day, there's one monkey oh, left at the Bonnet House. Yeah. One of the troop that was there. Last I heard there was three, but I guess now yeah, there's one. Yeah, it's reduced to one, unfortunately. And then when that one goes, that's it, so. Okay. What site was this? It could be anywhere, right? Yeah. Well, but you, you all, I'm sure you know. That's by the airport, the old railroad around the airport there? Uh, nope. Good try, though. A little further down, a little further west. 
Go west, young man. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I'll talk to you. Almost got it. You're close. I know you know it. Very, yes. Yeah, he's got the location, but he can't remember the name. Anybody can come up with a name? Brain And you probably can't, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's, it, it was only open for two years. Wild Wild West, true. Something like Pioneer, 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 Pioneer City, Pioneer, Pioneer City, Pioneer City. Yeah. Here it is. Pioneer City was a replica Western town built exactly as it would have looked out in the West. The gentleman that uh, he was a millionaire who built it, and he was fascinated with Western frontier culture. It was also in, this was in the '60s as well. It was back in the time when Bonanza and Gunsmoke and all these shows were on TV. Wild Wild and West. Wild Wild West. I mean, you can go down to numerous, uh, numerous of these, you know, kind of shows. And this this was open exactly at that, that time, capitalizing on on the. Where was it? This was at the Longkey. What today is the Longkey Nature Center. Um, and we'll see the connection. There's another connection with the same place, but we'll get to that. And so the buildings were built, he brought carpenters and he brought in, this was, he used architects to design the buildings. It was nice. It was nice. It, it was supposed to replica Dodge City, Kansas. And so, and it had obviously everything that a small town would have, a saloon, a, it had a general store, it had um, uh, where the ladies pick up, what's that called? Oh, they do their dances and stuff like that. Um, a barber shop, an undertaker, a casino, an opera house, a Pony Express office. At 12 noon, there were stage gunfights every day for the children. Let's see what else. It was carved out a 200-acre hammock um, right off of Flamingo Road. I'm sorry? Western theme when Davy became a city, a municipality? That's a good question. I don't know if Davy's theme is connected to this. I think Davy's theme is connected to the whole horse culture that has been there forever and the groves and the kind of farming background. But who knows? I don't, I, this came in late. I mean, it came in 65, 66. Oh. It was open for two years, and yeah. boom, it closed. Did the K-Pop tree uh, come in Yes. Day? Well, uh, you beat me to it, and I didn't want to go there yet. <laughs> What is this? It's not the Acropolis. Yes. Do, do anybody remember the K-pop tree? Yeah. Had? yeah. So, yeah. K-pop tree was. Um, it, it didn't get started here. It actually started somewhere else, and I think there was, the first one might have been in Clearwater, but then the original. And then several were built because it was so popular. And in its day, the, and this was built right on top of Pioneer City. Can you believe that? Exactly, exactly where Main Street, Main Street uh, Frontier City was located. You would have think, you would have thought they may have, may have built the restaurant like, uh, but no, they, they were going to take the whole thing down because this ambiance was totally different. It had nothing to do with, you know, the West and. Gun you know, gun smoke or anything like that. It was like being in the twilight zone, growing up. Growing up the, you know, <laughs> right. City, back I mean, of all places, right? in the most <laughs> furthest spot in Broward County to build a place like this, which was extravagant columns and chandeliers and rugs and just beautiful. And a, I don't know if the cuisine was that good because they claimed that fried chicken was like one of the top <laughs> items wow. there. But um, you could get steaks and fried chicken and shrimp and this kind of thing. But it was a very, for its day, it was the classy place to go. And people would dress up to go here, especially on Sundays. The families would all dress up to, um, to eat. And it was really fine dining at its finest. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, this is what it looked like. Amazing. So there was... statues in the movie Scarface? I don't know if Scarface used statues from 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 this place, but uh, obviously you know the Greek the the Greek influence is strong. I mean you could this is directly out of the in the when you go up the Acropolis there's a small building 
not in the you know the Parthenon itself, but a small side building that had these. Um, I think they were called caryatids, where the female figures that they, they were removed by the Greek government, by the way, to protect them from the smog. But that's another story. But um, here it is. I mean, it's such a fancy place. It's so detailed, so so gorgeous, so extravagant. Um, Lawrence Welk would have approved. <laughs> It really was a spectacle, and I think you know it was like a fantasy thing that most people were not used to. So it was, it was something. And from here, we're going to move to something completely opposite. Bianchi wanted to know what was there now. You said. Oh yes. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story about this place. When I started my career, it was 1991, exactly when this happened. And in '91, the Kapok Tree Inn had done. It was done. It was complete. It was it was abandoned. And it was actually demolished. And we were, we being, I worked for an archaeologist back then, Bob Carr, Robert Carr, yeah. who's like the, the South Florida archaeologist. I was just a young, you know, know nothing person. But this was one of my first assignments to go here with a team. And we did archaeology on the site of where the Kapok Inn is. Why? Because there's that area, which is actually Long Key, is a archaeologically rich area with many, many many archaeological sites. You just wouldn't believe how many archaeological sites there are, there are here. Literally dozens. So in, in and around the High Ridge area. And then the, this goes on to further east to um, uh, Treetops Park. So yes, this was an area that was used by prehistoric Americans. Why? Because this was a high area, significantly higher than the, than the rest of the surrounding Everglades area. So um, we were working, it was kind of creepy to work there because the columns were still up. They hadn't completed the demolition, so the columns were still up. Bits and pieces of the building were still there, and we were there trenching and excavating, trying to find you know, whatever we could find at that time. And then, and the gist of this was that the county was turning it into a park, and that's why we were doing the archeology. span Yes? If I, I don't know any history, but they built Pioneer City, then they built this, but it was an archaeological site, yes. and the county had no interest in, before the first approval, to go and find to find these relics that were below. Is that right? There was no well, no. The county actually paid for the archaeology that was done here when when the property ceased to be private and became public. So yes, the county got involved and turned it into a magnificent park. And if you haven't been there, please go. Uh, Pioneer City was 66, so before that it was in private hands, and no, there had been no archaeological, well, that may be going on us. There was a, there were archaeologists down here even in the 60s and 50s. Um, some of them were true blue archaeologists and academics, very few, and the other ones were sort of pot, pot, um, People that went in and excavated things for you know market value and this kind of thing. So there was a lot of that going on all over South Florida. You know, tre long, long key treasure. Center. Pardon me. Long Key Park. What was it called now? Today it's called Long Key uh, Nature Preserve or something like that. Broward yeah. County Park. It's a Broward County Park. Yeah, and there's a visitor center there that's absolutely spectacular, built over what used to be the Cape Oak Tree Inn, an elongated building, almost like the same footprint of the restaurant, where you can see an exhibit on what Pioneer City was all like, and they did a diorama, which is a model, a giant model of Long Key itself and how it changed over time. It's really, there's a Native American exhibit there that's really, I mean, up to par. It's like there's, there couldn't be anything better, really. I mean, it's just a spectacular. So if you have free time, when you have free time, Please pay a visit, and it's like for some reason it's like a secret. It's not when you go there. There's nobody ever there. <laughs> it's kind of weird. All right. So a lot of money spent in developing the park, but not many people actually go out, get out there. So we were just in the land of champagne and chandeliers and whatnot, and what was this? Yes. Yes. I can't put any. Oh, you guys are too good. Anyways, the caves, a truly kitschy and one of our favorite historic Florida treasures of the past was in Fort Lauderdale called the Caves Restaurant and Lounge. I'm just reading this out. This was a place where visitors were transported back to the Stone Age. 
That's right, this restaurant was prehistoric themed during the era of the Flintstones. And you dine in your own private cave with a waitress dressed like Wilma. <laughs> there were 39 tables and caves in the restaurant, complete with pillows to make your sight a little comfier. So I just included that because I thought this was so unusual. I mean, I don't, there are other caves around the country, but not in South Florida. And if you go from the K-Pok, which is like the height of the elegance back in those days, to the caves, which is completely different, what a, what, a, what a change, what a difference, right? There it is. A little unique. Everybody had their own little cave. <laughs> the caves. Let's see. So. No, I always wanted to go and then it closed. <laughs> Well, it was still around in the 1990s when I found a Sun Sentinel article. I'm not sure, maybe one of you all, if, I don't know if it, I can't seem to find a year when, first, when it first opened. I don't know. I don't know when it was built. I know that a couple from Boston purchased it uh, back in the 60s. Uh, so, and it was already existing when they bought it. They bought it from. It smelled really gross inside. <laughs> it did. It looks like fun. I mean, I, w I think I would have loved to have visited a place like this, and it was just as fun on the outside as on the inside. Look at that. Just really crazy. <coughs> Let's see what's there now. Oh my God. Yep. A vitamin shop. It's the little building on the right hand side. That is where the caves we used to be. And that's that not the original the same. building? No. The original building was destroyed. And they put that in there. It just lo looks like anywhere USA today, really. So, it's Federal Highway and... Uh, duh, 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 duh. Let me see. Oh. At the end of this presentation, my, my email is going to show up and phone number and all that contact. If you want to get back with me, email me. I've got all this information, but I'm sorry. I'm like lost in trying to keep up with the presentation and all this reading material. and I don't want to read everything to you because I think that's going to be somewhat stayed. So, but if anybody, again, this goes for anybody. If you need follow-up um, information, I'd be glad to provide it if you email me and the email will be provided at the end. What site was this? Somebody's got to know. I know you know. This is this one was a really famous spot. I'm surprised. I'm surprised nobody can. Somebody's gonna know, and you know why you don't know? Because it, it, it came down a long, long time ago, unfortunately. Yeah. Yep. Something like that. Yes. This was the two million dollar Banyan tree attraction in Dania, not too far from the chimp farm. This was the famous banyan tree. It wasn't much to look at compared to today's banyans because but today's banyans have been around now for close to 100 years. But back in the 20s, this was a sight to be seen. And um, it was planted in front of a grove and it took off. And the cool thing about it was that, you know, banyans, they, 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 they grow offshoots that grow from top to bottom, right? So nobody had seen that. When you're visiting from up north, you don't see those kind of trees. And uh, it was highly unusual, and they decided, don't ask me why, please, but it became the $2 million banyan tree. Was it worth $2 million? Doubtful. But that's what they called it, and it sure attracted attention. People came to visit it and take pictures, and there was a souvenir shop, and it became a very famous roadside attraction, also near the airport. Where was it? Well. Because it came down so many years ago, so many decades ago, I'm not 100% on that. Nobody really knows. I asked many, many people. My best shot with where it was, this, and again, this is a period aerial from 1955. So everything has changed since then, obviously. But this is US-1. Here's the Dania Canal, right? Here's the chimp farm. And then just high, this can't be it. This can't be it. A little bit higher up, there's an area that looks like a nursery. 
This looks like a nursery to me because just the, the amount of trees were growing. A lot of palm trees were growing. A lot of palm trees. In there, and it's half from Griffin Road to where the Griffin Vansy Farm. It was halfway there. Camp. Is where the Vansy okay tree was. over here. Yeah, and then there was a big restaurant. Yes, a French restaurant well, that had no. That was this, that was different. Oh, this, <laughs> this is a place. No. Yeah. Well, this is very interesting, and, I'm, and thank you for. So maybe I have it wrong. Maybe it's not up here. Maybe it's over here. I thought it was on the watch side of She says it was the Viking. The Viking was the uh, restaurant with the ice show. Yeah. Okay. So this is this this aerial is 1955. By 1955, this area had changed significantly. The tree went back to the 20s and 30s, by the way. So I'm not on, again, I'm not 100%. This is an educated guess of where it might have been. This is a nursery. This area down here does not look like a nursery. I'm not sure what's, what this is. It might have been planting, you know, um, it might have been, I don't know, strawberries, plants, something like that. And here's the, the chimp farm. We know that it was on the east side of the highway. Yes. Okay, east, so here's the highway, so it would have been on this side, not on this side. Here's the airport. Here's the airport. Here's the jazz place called the Banyan Club, was right next to it. Next to it? Well, I went there, and later on that turned into August Moon, a Chinese restaurant. Oh. Wow, well, but, but what year was that? What year was that? You told us to speak, so forgive us for interrupting. What year was that, sir? It's. I would say around the early 60s. Early 60s. So I'll go back and look at 1960s era aerials and see yeah. if those buildings come up, and that, that will help. I know the August um, moon was around in the late 70s. Oh, it's okay. Well, I think we spent a lot of time on this. Like Again, this is part of the detective work. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. I'm not 100%. My, my hunch is that it was, this is Griffin, right? The new Griffin. This is actually the older, the new Griffin. Okay, so the tree would, have, my hunch is the tree would have been in this area, and US one when it was expanded from from a two laner to what it is now, which is like a six laner, the expansion would have happened to the east, not to the west, because to the west was the railroad. Yeah. So it's railroad right away. So to the east is where they would have grabbed land, to, you, you make US one wider. So that would have impacted the tree, right? And we all know that the tree came down because of US-1. That's part of the story, that the tree was removed because US-1 was being widened. So again, going back with this hunch is this is where the tree would have been. And it would now roughly be where this triangle is, somewhere around here, most likely under pavement. I don't think it would have been. Blue, where was it that? In that area there. Here? Yeah, like yeah. over where you're Cardinal Blue? Okay. Blue. That's the K Park tree that's still right there now, right? In the corner that they kept? Yes. The K Park yeah. tree? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the K Park yeah. tree? There's there's a there's a K Park tree there. there? Yeah. Okay, and the Le Cordon Blue was where that cluster of trees is to the right of that, on the west side of Federal Highway. Okay. And the Viking Rafter would have been on the east side of the Viking was an ice skating uh, place, a giant, beautiful ice skating oh, wow. hall right across from it. And they had restaurant in there too, the bar. So it was right across from that. But I think, what, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Daniel was he, he been on the on the what side? Don't care. Don't bother. Um, I've, again, that's arguable. But they said they, it happened because of the expansion of US one. So the original US one, I believe, was the west lanes of of today's US one. Those are the what the original US one. And then the today's lane, extra lanes, it's now six lane highway. I mean, come on, it's like, you know, it's nothing like it used to be. The, all this is new. And I think this new would have ex impacted the tree because the tree was built very close up to US-1. It was within sight of it. But anyway, you go this, it's very misleading if you look at it, this area today. There's actually an, a nursery, yeah. It, it, there's a wetland area up here now. It's like wet, you know, most of the year, and then there's mangroves and all this kind of FPNL plant. I mean, this does not look anything like if you go back to the 1955 aerial. It doesn't look anything like it at all whatsoever. And of course, the um, Fort Lauderdale airport's here, and then here it gets really crazy. This is where 
you go under the actual runway of the airport. I mean, that doesn't happen in many places in the world, but here the runway goes right over US-1. It's amazing. One billion dollar project. Um, again, I'm here <laughs> harping again on what, where I thought the, the, the tree might have been. Banyan trees go, they really grow big, and the fact that we had a large one doesn't really mean much. When you look at other examples around the country, um, look at the one in Lahaina in Maui, or the one at uh, <laughs> the Frost Winter Estate with Mr. Frost there in uh, frozen kind of sculptural form. And look at these things. They're amazing. Yeah, these things have really, really grown. They're not indigenous to South Florida. Does anybody know where they're from originally? India. And in case you're wondering, you're looking at the biggest banyan in the world located right outside of Calcutta. It covers 3.5 acres. It's over 250 years old and it's considered the widest in the world. Look at this shot. <laughs> acres. Is that one tree? 3.5, yes, one tree. Oh my gosh, yeah, 3.5 acres. Amazing. There's another one in Buenos Aires, in the, uh, if you, anybody been to Buenos Aires, in the Recoleta neighborhood, which is where Evita Peron is buried. Giant. It's so big that they've got metal poles holding it up, um, <laughs> the branches holding it, because they feel like it's going to collapse. And that's growing in Buenos Aires, which is pretty, it's a completely different climate, you know, temperate, much cooler than here or India. Okay. Can trees protect it? I get this question a lot when we work in historical preservation. Why? Because trees really are part of the natural domain and they're not under specifically under historic most of the cases. But here's my answer to this if anybody's interested in the topic. Local govern governing bodies have a good deal of say regarding what can happen with properties. This includes historic and archaeological protections and can extend to natural features. Does your historic preservation ordinance address historical landscapes and trees? That's just a rhetorical question. Yeah. Most of you live in Hollywood. It's a question for you all to consider. You know, if you want to preserve a tree, find out. A because not, uh, the the county or the city local tree ordinances um, that have been passed by municipalities and county generally are to protect native specimens not exotic specimens. Exotic means foreign in this, in this kind of government speak. And everything is literally exotic, if you think about it. Our, our landscape here resembles nothing of what it re resembled 150 years ago. Yeah. Nothing. Not even the St. Augustine grass, which is sitting on your lawn, is from here. So everything has been changed every tree has changed everything has changed except when you go to a natural hammock area where you know they've made the effort of keeping it as pristine as they can in some cases they've even recreated it because it's been muckied up and the, you know they remove the exotics and they try to maintain the the native and what about the mangroves yeah the mangroves, well, mangroves are a big deal here as you well yeah, know there. but i'm not going to get into that issue <laughs> it's a little controversial and a lot of people are pulling down the trump the city ordinance the county ordinance Trump does not trump the, the cities have a lot more say than the, the well, way, than what you, you think. You got the city commissioners right. sitting back. Right. Right. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. County ordinance trumps the cities. What's that? County ordinance trumps the cities. Okay. Okay, I stand corrected. The county ordinance trumps the cities. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that these are natural protections. These are we're not, and I'm trying to stay focused on the historical angle, which is our trees historical. Think of it from that point of view. Can you make a pitch for trees that are historic? Um, so, in West Palm Beach, two 70-year-old banyan trees had the honor of receiving historic designation from the city. The banyan trees are now two of three trees in the city with historical designation. So, hey, West Palm Beach did it. In Miami-Dade County, the Historic Preservation Board designated a baobab tree and several tree-lined roadways. Again, these are trees that are not from here, so they're not protected. These are considered exotic trees, but they're of historic value. So the city or county historic preservation board, in the case of Miami Day, has gone a step further and actually protected these unusual, you know, historic, yes. Yeah, there's a question. The baobab tree. Yeah. Are there 
my favorite novel, The Little Prince. That's where they came from, another planet. It's, it's, it's a book, you know. Okay. <laughs> 1944, The Little Prince. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm familiar with the book. And the baobab tree originally is from Africa, the ones that we have here. They were brought, the original ones were brought by Dr. Fairchild, who had a plant introduction station. He was friends with uh, the owner of our historical house, uh, Hammerstein, mm -hmm. Clarence P. Hammerstein. Yeah. So Dr. Fairchild did a lot to propagate, and there was also a agricultural experimental station in, um, in Miami at, in Southwest 136th Street, which is still there. And they brought in plants from all over the world that were collected by Fairchild, by Dr. Simpson, and, uh, Tor Simpson, and many other naturalists who went all over the world and brought plants to South Florida to improve the, appear the physical appearance of South Florida. Why? Because we didn't have what in those days was considered beautiful and w our Garden of Eden needed to be recreated in the eyes of many. And so that's why we have the gorgeous tree specimens and flowers and the variety of plants that we do today. Um, basically, it's a recreated landscape, and it's not the original landscape, and I keep going to that. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not arguing either one way. But what we have today is kind of like the Garden of Eden in man's view of what, you know, what a tropical paradise should look like rather than what it really is. So let's go. In Miami Beach, the city designated Pine Tree Drive based based on its median with Australian pines. Australian pines are like the past tree, the, those and the Melaleucas are like the most hated trees in South Florida ever. I mean, all your, um, your environmental departments want to get rid of these, burn them, get rid of them, destroy them. But here in Miami Beach, they were protected, only a few, because they're really, really old on Pine Tree Drive. And if you travel down Pine Tree Drive, it's a gorgeous drive with these knotted, Australian pines that are huge, and they're right on the median, and they provide shelter. I personally, I always love Australian pines, but I know it's not politically the thing to say these days. But and here in Broward, the Seminole Tribe designated Council Oak, which you can see right off of Four Four. Whoa! <laughs> Those monkeys—they're messing with me. The monkeys are back. Okay. Well, <laughs> coming back to the. The Seminole Tribe designated its Council Oak, which is a giant oak that you can see from 441. It's on the west side of 441, just south of Sheridan, I believe. Um, and it's it passed by it real quick and you'll miss it. But it's beautiful, it's huge, and it's actually where the tribe sat down back in the 60s and discussed itself how it was going to incorporate, it wasn't recognized yet by, this, by the federal government, and that's where they, back, I'm sorry, it was the 50s, late 50s, where they, where they discussed their constitution, how they were going to get organized, and then finally came to the fact that they did get organized, and, and the government officially recognized them as Native Americans, as if you need recognition from the federal government to be a Native American, but that's the way this world works. Okay, what site was this? We're back to the monkeys. Monkey jungle. Mm, monkey jungles in Miami. No, nobody. Somebody want to give it a try? I know it's hard because it's just got two monkeys and it's well. No, I don't. But I picked it on purpose so that you. Is this a Miami? No, the, all these are in Broward. No, I don't. These are lost sites of Broward people. So remember, it's Broward. Yes. Just want to say those aren't monkeys. No, you're absolutely right. They're chimps. Yes, the rapes. Oops. They're apes. I hate that. I'm sorry. Stand corrected. You're absolutely right. Okay, well. Oh, on the Jungle Queen cruise? No. And this one is probably going to predate most people. This is why it's kind of like a, a Trump one. Fort Lauderdale behind Gate One. Yes. Fort Lauderdale. Behind Gate One. Yes. Yeah. Okay, somebody got it. Yay. No, I don't remember. Clyde Beatty Zoo. You are right. And that goes to the gentleman in the front. Um, Beatty, Clyde Beatty was a famous um, uh, animal yeah, uh, performer. Did. And he really became famous. I mean, he was like the top of, of his name back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, right up until his death in 65. So in, 
he bought an existing lion farm that already existed in Fort Lauderdale in 1939, the McKillop Hutton Lion Farm, which um, it was it had opened in 1936, so only three years earlier. It wasn't that old, and it was in a rock quarry where today's the south end of the Gateway um, uh, shopping plaza and movie theater. If you go into that residential neighborhood immediately south of the Gateway. That's where it was. You and I'll show you. Rock, yes. Rock, yes. You've seen it. Yes. Um, and what Beatty used it, uh, he was a circus performer, but he used it as a breeding farm for, for zoos. And then he opened it also as a tourist attraction, which before that, tourists hadn't come here. Um, and here he is doing what he was doing best. I mean, he was just, uh, his claim to fame was that he could. He had like um, 30 to 40 cats, a variety of cats, not just lions, but tigers, lions, jaguars, this kind of thing. And you know, he had all these very, very dangerous animals and he alone <laughs> had, was surrounded with these animals he, and he could control them. And so this was a big thing because you know, nobody else was doing that uh, at this time. And he, he toured with the Ringling Brothers for a couple of years, but he was really famous in of his own and he broke away from many others. He, the largest tent uh, circus in the United States at that time was him and an associate. Um, and here is again doing uh, what he did. And th this was not open for very long. The Clyde Beatty Zoo, which again he bought in 46 by 49, three years later, because people were complaining. Residents were moving in the area. This is Victoria Park. Today's Victoria Park. Residents were complaining of the animal sounds and the smells and all this kind of thing, and they were just over it. And even though the, this thing had been there before, it had been there since much before the people started really coming in. Um, all these, the city took note of, and they were like pushed out. And uh, Mr. Beatty was and his wife, who both ran this place, were were really upset over it. They left never to come back. Um, <clears throat> And it was a rock quarry. Unfortunately, this is what the rock quarry looked like. It was just gorgeous. I mean, look at the, the size of those rock walls. The animals were contained within the quarry. They couldn't move any further. And um, the walls were quite steep and high enough that the lions couldn't climb up and, and remove themselves. So they were contained in this you know, square area. And it had ponds, and you can see swans, and it was really pretty. Um, none of which is there today, by the way. And there it, there it is in this aerial shot, um, 1947. It's actually showing up where the arrow is indicating. You see the small little black spot that's a uh, pond within, within it. And those dark spots to the north along the kind of highway, highway there, that sunrise that's curving as it's, as it's bridging over to hit the beach area. Those dark spots are where the Gateway movie theater and um, shopping plaza are today. Yeah. So wow, it's built on water. <laughs> built on water, can you believe that? Yeah. It's right behind El Molino, so that neighborhood. Yes, so exactly. So did they fill the quarry? Yes, they filled the quarry, and this is what the area looks in today. Yeah. Absolutely, who would know, right? I mean, this gentleman says he's driven by there and he's seen segments of it. But I mean, if most people, if you pass by there, you would never know, A, there was ever a zoo here, or there was a rock quarry, or anything like that. Beautiful attraction that was there until the late 40s. No, nothing. It's a condo and houses. But, here and here it is. Question, what kind of rock was it? Lime or uh, really good? We're on a lytic limestone here in, in Broward County. Oolite. Not Coquina as it is in northern Florida. The, the walls... The walls are still there. Now, they, granted, they're not as deep as they were because this area has been completely filled. And they're not really nice to look at because they're, I don't know, I think they've been crumbling and people have been patching them with stuff and they really look in disarray. But the wall that you're, whoa, the wall that you're seeing on the right-hand side is the last tiny, what this thing? There's a flying monkey here, this monkey with me. Anyway, the. That wall segment is like the last remaining segment of what used to be. It's probably the south wall of the quarry. And that is it. There's nothing else left. Do you want to 
let me put it back there. I mean, if you drive by there, you'll, you'll see it. It's, it's completely visible. Uh, what site was this? Anybody? Try it. Pirates World. What's that? Pirates. Yes. If you guess Pirate World, you're right. I think the gentleman in the front has gotten most of these. I think he deserves a prize here because he's really been awesome. We here at first. Oh, okay. All right. So there's competition. And that was a great place, that was a great place to go. Pirate's World. Pirate's World is one of the places that I do remember as a kid. And, um, of course, it was a pirate theme to it. The, let me see if, I don't know if there are any shots. Yeah, um, there's a host of, of uh, amusements. I mean, I can read the list, but those of you who went there, you, you know what it was all about. I'll say this, I heard that, and I went to the New York World's Fair in 1964, the steeplechase yes. and the log flume, from my understanding, came from the New York World's Fair. That's, that's what the record says, yes, that's true. The Pirates World was a little bit of a hodgepodge. They were removing relics from other attractions, and, uh, and for example, the 64 World's Fair in New York, and this gentleman was absolutely right, and they removed objects and then reconstructed them here. So yeah, everything was re, um, you know rehabilitated and reused um, with a, with a purpose. And they used to have concerts there. And they had rock and roll concerts. Yes, there was a green. Look at the flumes with the horsies on the right. That's great. I love that. Yes. Where else would you see that? I mean. The kids used to ride the steeplechase to the top of the yes. hill, and they jump off and run down the scale oh, really? fence to get the concert. Oh really? <laughs> So we're almost at the end, folks. Just bear with me. And then here's a couple of ads of the different, different. So right next to Pirates World, there was an open field, which was part of Fire Pirates World, where the rock concerts were held. And they were held right up until, you know, the closure of Pirates World. So a lot of bands, a lot of famous bands, bands that are still playing today, play, play there. And here's the layout of Pirate's World for the tourist. Where was it? Well, the picture on the left shows exactly at its height in 1971, um, right after construction and what it was. And then you see that strip, the kind of scarified land on the right-hand side. Um, that is where the, a lot of the rock concerts happened. You see the little lakes and lagoons. And then we shift to 2022 aerial it's all gone except for a small pond on the upper left hand. Do you see the configuration? It's exactly the same and it's even got the small little island that was there. Isn't that cool? So yeah, Pirates World is gone, but in in you know, in some kind in some shape or form it's still the outline of a of a lake is still there to remember us. Otherwise, if you would pass there today, this is right off of um, Sh Sterling, right? Sheridan. 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 Yeah, if you were to pass by today, you, there was no way you would, you know, know one way or another where, where this where this was. Is that east of US one? It's east of US one. Yeah. It would be like like Thirteenth uh, Avenue. There it is. I mean, yeah. you get your bearings right there. This is an exact uh, overlay of where Pirates World would be if it had existed in relationship to today's landscape. So. I think this is our, oh no, this is almost last, second to the last. What site was this? We all know. Right. I don't hear an answer. All right. You do know. Good. So this building was actually designed by a famous architect, Robert Law Weed. And he did a lot of buildings in Miami Beach. He was very well known in the 30s and 40s, by the way, but this building is from the 50s. He did. He was a modernist. Sorry, what was his name? Robert Law Weed. Thank you. I'm sorry, Reed. Reed, not Weed. Reed, R-E-E-D. Robert Law Reed. Yeah, he was commissioned to do this. This brought Highlight down here. Um, and we all know the story of Highlight. The Highlight, unfortunately, has disappeared. I think the last game in South Florida was in 2020 or 21. Have they started? With real players? 
But it's also a casino. Yeah, well, this is a, the sport of highlight comes, uh, many of you have heard, it comes from the Basque region of Spain and it's played at a localized level there. And we, my brother, my brother is actually best friends with a high line player from Biarritz, France, because the Basque country overlaps two countries, Spain and France. Where's Joey, is Joey in there? Remember I don't know, you pick him out if you can see him. Hey Joey, hey Joey, are you there? Joey. <laughs> so this is what it looked like in its heyday. You know, we had another fronton in Miami that one, um, unfortunately, is now completely ca ca casinoized. But today, this is what it looks like. And I included it in the Lost Sites because even though supposedly this is the original building, it sure does, what of the original building survives? I don't know, it completely lost the Robert Law Reed appearance and it is a brand new facility. You know, it's been completely modernized. And this is what, it is a casino. And somebody just said, yes, they're still playing Highlight. I wasn't aware of that. They actually brought it, it back? Again. Yeah? OK, good. Maybe it hasn't completely died. I mean, the story was that this sport was like only elderly folks were still betting on it and attending, and the attendance was low. And, and those teenagers that used to sneak in so. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> OK, so this is the last one. Yay. What is this site? What are we looking at? Oh my God, I just, uh, don't come to the next lecture, please. <laughs> this gentleman knows everything, he really does. Anybody else, anybody wants to shout out its name? Does anybody remember the name? Yes, it's the Upside Down House. And this, I thought this was gonna be a stumbling block because nobody was gonna figure out what this, I mean. Yeah, but the, 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 the Christmas tree is upside down. So yes, yeah, Santa is perplexed. But the upside down house, this is the upside down house, and it was in Sunrise. It was basically a developer's gimmick to get people to stop here. The car, look at the car. Yes, the car is suspended from the carport um, uh, floor, actually, right? It was great, and you could actually go in it. It wasn't just uh, you know an outside and a fake facade. You can go in it, and everything was literally suspended from the ceiling. So it was, everything was upside down in here. And it was a big hit. It really made people stop. And the, again, the only reason why it was built was to bring new buyers into the scheme. When was it built? When was it built? I believe it was 63 or 64. Let's see. Hold on. My grandparents, if you don't know, kid, I remember it. Pretty cool. Uh, where was that? Was sunrise. Sunrise. It was near the terminal. It was, it was, I think it was commercial and when it's 441. It was 1960. 1960, yeah. Yes, 1960. That, that sounds more like it. When did it go away? In 1960, South Florida developer Norman Johnson saw an upside down car at a Miami auto dealership and thought of a way to promote his new development, Sunrise Golf Course Village, on 2,650 then rural acres west of Fort Lauderdale. This house attracted thousands of home, home buyers to what is now the city of Sunrise and was featured in a two-page Life magazine spread. Um, well, they didn't really want to demolish it, did eventually bite the bullet, but it was moved three times from its original location. Wow. Here it is again. There's a family actually visiting. I like the car. I went to the car. Yeah, it's a splendid car. That's a Plymouth. Is that St. Plymouth? I don't know. Here's the upside down house right side up. Have you ever seen that? No. No. So here's the correct angle of it, but it's like actually floating on the sky. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Completely strange. Somebody just turned the camera upside down. Here's the original location of the upside down house. Do I, did I put it down? Here it was. And today, this is where it was. 6021 Northwest 22nd Court. 12th Court, I'm sorry. 
And yes, it was, it was removed from this lot, so what's there now is absolutely nothing. Um, oh, oh, there is one more. Uh, I think this was the second or third, this was not the original site right here, because you can see a canal on the back of this one, right? And the, again, this, this being the original site. So this is obviously the second or third site. And then eventually it was demolished. But what, what, how tragic, no? This would have been fantastic if we had, if it had been preserved and kept up to, to today. No one can you know? do that right now, only the artists. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to build something like that today. I mean, well, I don't know. Eh. There, there's like a car, in Miami, there's a car that was built on a, well, was built like hanging from a wall on Biscayne Boulevard, US 1. Police, Police Museum, yes. We know when it was Still there. Um, let's see. No. I don't have a demolition date. Nope. But then, um, you know, it's a good question, obviously. But because it was moved around, you know, it's like obviously somebody didn't want to see it removed completely, and then there was an interest in keeping it up, but sad to say that it, ha it is gone. Um, what site? I didn't know there was more. Okay. Oh, this is the last one. I'm sorry. I thought the upside down house was the last one, but this is the absolute last one, and then everybody can go home. Okay. No. It's unfair to say aquaplanes. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. You know, when you're as old as Chris, you know the answer. Did I go to the next slide? Oh boy. Yeah. Well. Okay. That was a cheat. This one. Um, those of you that know Clive. I didn't. I never heard about this site, but Clive emailed me about two weeks ago, and he said, "Oh, look at this one. This one I remember as a kid." Oops. And Aqua Glades Park was a really, really tiny roadside attraction on uh, State Road 84, uh, just east of what today is the Florida Turnpike, but west of I-95. Oops. And it had the typical gator wrestling and Seminole Recreated Village and all this kind of stuff. It had a gift shop with curios. This is where it was, Aqua Glades, right there. You see the arrow? It's indicating exactly where it was with the, with the you know, you see the parking area off of State Road 84 on the south end. By the way, this one I did not know where it was. And this was, again, just sleuthing around. And Clint, Clint, Clive didn't know where it was exactly either, but this is the spot. Nothing else looks like it. Everything else is marine industry. This area here is kind of like natural, and there's a pond, and there's trails, and there's a parking area, and th this was sort of, a, and then there was an entrance building. So that's kind of a giveaway of a typical tourist attraction um, of, of there, the day. There's a city there that, that uh, was a terrible city. I forget the name. Washington Village. What is it? Hacienda Village, right. Um, this is what happened to it. It's now a marine industry boat. It's a boatyard. So it's been completely paved over. And that is the end. Thank you so much. Thank you.